The Ibarra wetlands is an endless system of perfect habitat for Golden Dorado. You could be sliding through these narrow channels of this swamp and you could hear every frog, every bird. You could hear caiman climbing through the grass. It can go from zero to a hundred in a blink of an eye. And when a fish would eat, it was just violent. These things are killing machines. There's no other way to put it. I've never experienced a fish that fights as hard as the Dorado do. <laughs> so just so strong. I'm fighting that thing and it's just dogging, pulling me. And all of a sudden, oh! Handline, handline. Yeah, fighting a Dorado, it's no joke. Fighting a Dorado, you hook that fish and it's gonna go airborne in like 0.4 seconds. It's like hooking a largemouth bass mixed with the rattlesnake, AKA the rattle bass, that's now got tangled up with some eagles or something, you know, something that jumps, a, a leaper, if you will, you know, boom, do, doing this. We had just spent three days fishing the Paraná River. Finally sealed the deal with a giant fish. But at the end of the day, we still fished two and a half days with only one real fish to write home about. Now we're headed to the Ibarra wetlands, which is basically a national park in northern Argentina. It's about a three hour drive and a small short flight from where we were on the Paraná. My personal mission on this part of the trip is to get my first Dorado. One of the motivations for us is we knew we were gonna to go to this other place that had a lot different scenery, a lot different wildlife, and a lot more Dorado. We stopped off in a little town called Asuncion and from there had a nice time in this little hotel. It was a converted ranch house. It was kind of cool because they brought in some chamame dancers, kind of a folky dance type thing from that region. Great experience, but that little town is the jumping off point into the big wetlands. This looks like a field. This is not a field, this is an airport. We pull up, we know that there's a flight, no airport in sight, but we pull up to a cow pasture. That is not the pilot, that is Curtis. This is not the 12 year old, it's Brigham. Brigham, you're not even recording. Stop it. Gonna hitch a ride, so we're gonna have to take a little puddle jumper. Cheech is super giddy about this one. And then from the distance, we see little white wings starting to appear. 70, 172. I don't really know that much about Cessnas, but I have a Cessna remote control airplane, so I'm pretty much an expert. <laughs> so because the wetlands is so big, we had to take a small Cessna Brig and I, squirrels in the back. That's the way to do this. And I'm sitting in the front. I just remember looking in there. If I would have looked at the amount of space in that freaking airplane versus my truck, I would have said, okay, this is for one person. And I'm 6'5", weigh about three bills. I'm looking giant next to a little guy. And we had comments from the back, hardy har har. In 1982, Argentina realized they had something really, really special with this wetland system. The Ibera wetlands are the second biggest wetland system in the world. Roughly 5,000 square miles of protected reserve. Entering into the, the wetlands, you don't see too many other people because it's so secluded and, and protected. One of the things that dawned on me, how cool that we were gonna be able to have this opportunity to go in this specific area inside the marsh, twice the size of the Everglades, hit this amazing fishery, 
and fish for these beautiful fish. After we landed the plane, we arrive just in the middle of nowhere. There's no water to be seen anywhere. And we drive through and there's this little boat dock with a little narrow canal that goes out into the, the wetlands. So we jump in this skiff, much smaller than the skiff that we were on in the Paraná. All of a sudden, we just start tearing off through this, this canal. <laughs> through this canal, it looks like you're going straight into just a field of grass, and then once you get here, there's a little channel that opens up, barely big enough for the boat, and we hit it at full throttle, and we go through. I asked our guide, I said, so where are the Dorado in here? And he just looks at me, he goes, everywhere. go up and it just all of a sudden opens up into this giant lagoon. These guys were navigating purely based on experience being out on the water. They don't have any GPS or anything. As you go into this place, it's so giant. There are multiple deluxe camps set up throughout these systems. We were heading north. There's a little cabin up there. Before we went to the cabin, we decided to finally go and see if we can catch a few Dorado. There's a caiman right there. This uh, caiman is not going to be happy me invading his territory. All right, bud. Here we go. It's just you and me. In a lot of these areas, you're fishing little side channels that are really small, so you're really limited to one person fishing on the bow. Oh, dude, you've got to follow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, he tanked that thing. Holy crap. Look at the rod is tacoing. So freaking rad. Just so strong. All right, he's getting a little tuckered out. Boom, yeah. Oh, I've man. never experienced a fish that fights as hard as the Dorado do. It's insane. Bye-bye. Wow. Holy crap, that thing was powerful. Yeah. Monkeys off my back. And full display of power because no current. We get out there and, and it's totally different fishing conditions. The habitat's completely different. You've got lily pads everywhere. Instead of throwing as much line as you could, it was all about accuracy, placement, short casts, and just being ready to strip set in any second. Already on. Got it. Oh, the second it hit the water, Nate. Curtis finally caught one. Everybody's stoked. Cheech and Curtis off the schneid. We fish hard. And then it's Brig's turn. Brig, you're up. Let's do some work. Here, Brig. Now, freaking Brigham, because there weren't any mountain lions in the area, the Carpinchos started coming to check it out. Carpincho is a capybara. Yeah, yeah. Dude, this, look at <laughs> this thing coming. He's like, what's going on, bros? <laughs> hey, don't. So we have a Dorado on, a Capybara, and Hermano Wilson on. He's coming? Yeah, boy! That a boy, Brig. That was right in the next time, Brig. It's 7 o'clock. Now, talking with old Lucas, you know, we're uh, exchanging stories, if you will. So I said, hey, when, when you don't catch any fish, like I didn't that day, it's called you get skunked. He's like, skunk, that's weird. He's like, we call it the sapo here. Sapo means toad. Okay. okay. I sealed the deal on that sapo. I made sure the sapo happened. The fishing really didn't turn on very much that day. I mean, we, we caught a few fish, um, two fish. But guess what? Those were Dorado. Everybody has caught a Dorado at this point. Everybody's stoked. 
we come back to camp. Brig had his own room. Curtis and I are sharing one room. We have some windows open because it's a little bit hot and a rainstorm hit. It was a rainstorm unlike any other rainstorm that I've ever seen. It was coming down. I don't sleep much. We get up the next day and it's, it's awesome. You ready to go fish? And allegedly, cannot be confirmed, but I will not deny it, I was speaking in third person. I don't even know what day it is of this trip. We slept in a jungle last night in an awesome little casita. Brig and Cheech, I mean Brig, Brig and I'm delirious. <laughs> Brig, and Curt, Brig and Curtis both got some awesome Dorado yesterday. We had a good dinner last night that uh, consisted of some fresh skirt steak and some food aid. Whoa. That was rudely, rudely interrupted. Dude, I think that's the one that ate Captain Hook's hand off. I can hear the clock ticking. Robin Hood's gonna beat your ass! <laughs> All right, so we're here, the gators. Yeah, said what I said. I'd like to apologize to my family and friends. I didn't have any sleep. I can't be held accountable for that and Brig will bleep it out anyway. So you don't really know if I swore, number one. Number two, you're thinking that I should have said Peter Pan. Well, guess what? Robin Hood and Peter Pan, a lot of people don't put this together. They're homies. Peter Pan hangs out closer to London. We had a huge rainstorm last night. Cheech couldn't sleep at all. Couldn't sleep at hilarious. all. Hilarious. This day might be the most entertaining yet, but more importantly, we need to go try to get Captain Hook's hand back. He's still there. The wildlife is almost worth going to the Ibera wetlands alone. So there's a lot of capybaras or carpinchos. There's some pretty gnarly spiders, these gigantic spider nests hanging out everywhere. So see that little thing right in the middle there? All these lines are going across. It's like a 30 foot spider web. Looked like, oh, they caught uh, a bat or they caught a, a freaking baby alligator because there's like this dark spot in the middle of this web that's kind of moving around. Well, the stuff moving around is about 4 billion quadrillion trillion spiders. That is a stuff nightmare. But then as we started going through the marsh, you'd see that these giant hammocks full of spiders having their parties, whatever they're doing, are like every hundred yards. Brigham was up once and he cast across and there was a spider web that went across the channel and he landed on top of the spider web and his, his fly got caught up. He tries to pull it off and couldn't break the spider web as easily as you'd think. So he had to get the streamer like really pull on it to break that spider web strand. So these are like some secret operative spiders building like some type of fiber that's going to be used in the future. But I didn't want any part of those things. A little baby. Cayman all over the place. Bird life is just off the charts. There's cranes and storks and eagles and cormorants, so many different animals, it's nuts. A lot of these guys ask why I have a GoPro on, why do I have a rain jacket on. I'm drinking Monster on the boat, and I got it all down the front of me. But guess what? I'm not wet. I'm smart. Got the rain jacket to protect me from my own spills. Mm. Oh, love them so good! This is insane, fishing a creek, or a little channel with giant river monsters in it. 40 pound bite wire and a giant fly. This alpha predator that can feel a fish this big turn around in the water is in these narrow channels. And I mean, these are as skinny as any trout stream that I fished totally different game in the wetlands versus the big Parana. Any movement whatsoever, you know, if you stepped on the deck, 
or the push pole. If you watch the guides pull the push pole out of the water, there was no splash whatsoever. So stealth was absolutely critical. If you're clanking around on the boat, casting and slapping flies down, sometimes that helps, but not all the time. If you're stripping and your fly line's picking up and slapping down on the water, all of those are factors in whether or not you're gonna be able to hook one of these fish. It was small stream trout sniping at its finest. But here we are fishing for these giant fish that are absolute predators with an eight weight and a giant fly. So coming out of the Ruwa camp, we come back into the main area, the main lagoon, which is where the Dispato camp is. And that's, that's their main sort of home base for those camps out there in that area. That whole marsh, there's very few landmarks. To even get into the area where the Dispato camp was, they'd have markers like sticks or things that they'd hang that you could see to kind of navigate yourself. Because there's no hills, there's no gigantic trees or anything. It's, it's really kind of fly by the seat of your pants. But when you get back in there, you pull up and they have a nice little boat landing. Amenities for at least being out there like that. They have a, a cool dining area that's a open air and they do the cooking in there and that's where you go to eat. From our end, we slept in tents and they have the tents on these little platforms with cots, it's super nice. And they've got running water in bathrooms, the guides have their own little area there. You know, you're in the middle of nature. It's probably one of the coolest camping experiences you'll have. So as we get back to the other camp, we were talking to another group that had done really well that morning. And as it turned out, we were gonna go to the same general area that the other guys had gone earlier. The Ibera wetlands, even though in Guarani it means bright water, the water was pretty murky on these, these days that we fished it. These fish can thrive in almost anything, any, any water color, because they are absolute predators. They're not going around looking for prey. They can feel the prey. These golden dorado use their lateral lines to hunt food, meaning they have microscopic holes in their sides all the way up their body with nerve endings that hit their spinal cord. So these fish can sense everything. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Dorado tail? Yeah, try Dorado tail. That's the one that the uh, big fish on the river reacted to, right? And if, they, if it will react to a, a cast from Brigham, then it will work for anybody. Okay, they're here. They're here, boys. Yeah. Lucas, I need you to tell me when the fish are going to eat, so I'm ready. No, I will <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh, he's pissed. Five minutes to spare, Chris. Dude. When you're fishing in a small skiff like this, usually you're going to fish until you hook up or get a shot and then you switch. I said to the guys, hey, I'm going to fish for an hour. And if I don't hook up in an hour, then Curtis, it's your turn. Literally minutes before an hour hits, I cast out, I strip, boom, Dorado on. Curtis and Brigham made me look like a really bad angler this day because it took me an hour and Curtis and Brig were hooking up every five to 10 to 15 minutes. So I kind of started that, that program as well. He's coming after it. He's coming after it. Almost at your six minute target. Ooh. H3 is doing a little work today. Boom. Their colors are just insane. I mean, they're 
as gold as gold as you can get. If you look at their tails, there's different colors in there. It's kind of orangish, reddish, but also their tails are just chewed up. And so because of that, we'd actually throw flies that resembled the colors of a Dorado tail. By having a fly that looked like a Dorado tail, you're stimulating the lateral line and creating a target for them to eat. Line, huh? Yeah, dude, this thing punches. Ooh. Get him. Oh, dude, he smashed it. Good job, Ron. Ron, 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 Mess, Who's the, Who's what the net man? You did that on purpose, Brigham. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they got him. Whipped it. That bite was sick. Yeah. How many H3s have you broken total in your life? <laughs> one. What? Two. Uh, Tom Rosenbauer's not here. Wait, have I broken another one? Yeah, you're four way. Oh yeah, yeah, but I sat on that one. <laughs> I don't plan on sitting on this one. We were lucky enough to have Lucas on this part of the trip as well. He knew the Paraná River like the back of his hand. He's been all over in Bolivia, but this place, you could tell that he had been all around here. He absolutely knew the areas where we were fishing, but more than anything, his whole career is based on Golden Dorado. He would say, okay, cast in here. If you hook that fish, you need to hurry and get him out of there because he's going to try to run under this. You know, that fish is going to jump one more time, so be ready. And sure enough, the fish would jump. Lucas knew these fish inside and out. It was really cool to learn how to fish for these fish and how to handle them and everything from Lucas. <laughs> The way it works is that there are no boats allowed except for the boats, the outfitters that we work with. Each day the guides go into different areas, so you technically shouldn't run into anybody else in a boat. That's cruising across that. Or Nico. Oh, it could be. As we're out there fishing, we hear what we thought was another boat. And Lucas was getting a little worried because there's not supposed to be other boats out there. We're hearing this. Lucas is on the, the radio trying to raise the other guide in a different vicinity. He was worried that something might be going on. And if not that, he'd have to call the ranger, have him come out and escort a boat that shouldn't be there, escort him off. Lucas, should we go? It turned out it was just a storm. This one actually came in and it kind of kept its distance, so you could still hear it and the rumbling, which is what we thought was the boat.
Good thing Sean Puffy Comb showed us what it takes to break an H3. Double rainbow in the background, Wilson on the stick, throwing the Orvis Helios 9 foot 8 weight H3 and a Lamson M reel. He's about to poke a big old Dorado. The fish were eating so fast, they would almost take your fly right off the surface. So I decided to tie some top water stuff on. Oh, mama. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. No oh, way. Oh, my goodness. I got people. Hurry up and catch one. Lakers do that? Lucas is right, you can't compare the two. I agree. <laughs> the guy, how about that? She's great. Because you don't expect to have the guy against you. <laughs> sometimes, you know. <laughs> what hook is that? Camera's up to SL12. It's 15 I think. Oh my gosh. Oh. I was really good at getting to eat it, but I could not set the hook. And I mean, I'm, I'm strip setting, I'm trying everything, and they just hit that thing so aggressively that no more luck on the top water fly. <laughs> Because this is a subtropical area close to the Amazon basin, you see a lot of storms and you see a lot of, of weather changes. So this storm sticks around and it, it ends up raining during the night. Here we go. Wind. So this day we wake up and all I remember is we're, we're, we're standing there on the dock getting ready to go out and the boat right in front of us, they get out into kind of a main channel, a, a wave hits the side of their boat and it just soaks them all. As soon as we had pulled the boat out of the Disparo camp, we realized this lagoon that we we're in front of was just white capping. We even told Lucas, hey, if you're not cool with going out here, we're, we don't you know, absolutely have to. Lucas just said, don't worry, we trust the boat. We've been fishing in 70 degree, 80 degree temperature, and now all of a sudden it's hoodie weather with rain gear on. On this trip, we learned that Dorado love the nasty weather, the changes in weather. They love the rainy days, cloudy days, overcast, anything like that, and they're gonna put the feed bags on. There is a big one around here. Don't trout set. Just keep stripping. The day before and then this morning, man, we are, we're in them. We finally found out where they are. We're catching, you know, five to 12 pound Dorado at will. That's how we do it. That is what ate Captain Hook's hand. I don't appreciate it. 
Even freaking Brigham got up there in Colorado. You know why? Because Brigham's skill set starts at six weight. Okay? Six weight, if you go up to an eight weight, he's good. He's real good. However, if you go down to a five or a four, you'll see why they call him six weight Wilson. Anyway, he was casting, bombing cast, hooking fish, strip setting. Off the water, yeah. Mm -hmm. Off the of lift, yeah. Okay. Oh, three. Sit down. Solid. Yeah. Oh. oh, you're up. Coolest throw. Yeah, one swipe. Yeah, little guy. Little guy, five pounder. Got to weed out the five, 10 pounders for the 25 pounders. So when Briggs with us, usually we'll get plenty of footage until the fishing gets insane, then we all just kind of take turns. Weather was bad, so we decided to just take the GoPros out. Brig catches a fish, and there's an aluminum handled net. You know, with aluminum, if you bend it back and forth too much, it's just gonna break. Oh, what is this net? The basket started to wobble. I'm not an expert, but that's not supposed to look like that. No. What happened, Chich? The Are net you broke. Expert? Do you have some duct tape? No. Paracord? No. Well, we have is a broken net. <laughs> Curtis is fishing. I'm dealing with this net, trying to get it to, to work again. And I've got both pieces in my hand. And then the GoPro runs out of battery. So Brigham's scrambling to get another battery. He hands me a GoPro. So now I'm net fixer and GoPro man. So all I need to say when Curtis hooks up is GoPro start recording. As I'm casting, I hook into this huge fish and it took a couple times to set. And once I do, it just goes airborne. We all went nuts. Like this was a giant. And I just stood there like dumbfounded. In my mind, I gotta be fixing this net to land this fish, but also I gotta be recording this. We had the blue screen of death on Cheech's brain. Beep. Press restart. By the time Cheech rebooted, we start filming. We missed the hook set. That's on me. I'm fighting that thing and it's just dog and pulling me and all of a sudden oh the rod snaps I just didn't even know what to do I'm like oh how am I supposed to get this fish in and I hear Lucas in the back Handline, handline. So I grab the fly line and I'm pulling. It just shoots up again. Apparently the handle of the aluminum net fell off the boat. Bear in mind, these things have razor sharp teeth and they're super strong. Cheech is trying to get down there. I slide in. <laughs> these money makers were in danger. Scoop the fish, miss it. Curtis hand lines again. Scoop the fish, kind of get it, and then finally it's in. Okay, we've got a broken rod. You got it? We got it in the net. 
<laughs> what the heck has happened to you? Curtis finally found his vaca. That means cow in Spanish. Hold them out, epic shit. Holy crap. We finally get it landed. It was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it was the craziest fish I've ever caught in my life. Just that whole sequence of events. It was nuts. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> oh, it's crazy though. We're hand lining it. She's just sitting in there with a net, no hand. Dude, I'm sacrificing these money makers. I almost could never tie flies ever again in my whole life. Dude, the freaking drone, you put me in front of the drone, you put me in front of a yellow dead gum freaking alligator. They push poles off the boat. That's the some story. epic shit. Where's the rod for the net? <laughs> oh, we lost the rod? For the net? Well, if it went in the water, it's gone. So we were under the impression that in the Ibarra wetlands that the, the fish were maybe a little bit smaller, not a ton of, you know, giants or vacas that they call them. We were super stoked to catch that big fish. It seemed like that fish was the catalyst for all the other fish to grow a few inches. Oh, pull. Pull. Oh! That's a vaca. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Brig got up there. He caught his biggest one of the trip. I got up there. I caught my biggest one of the Ibera. lost a net, a fly rod, hopefully we won't lose that gringo. <laughs> All this talk about the Ibera wetlands doesn't have big fish, we learned it does have big fish. And I don't even know how many fish we caught, but it seemed like for the last two days we just couldn't lose. This was one of the biggest wetlands in the world, a national treasure for Argentina, that only one outfitter in the whole world has access to go fish. That's set fly fishing. They're guys that we fish with for multiple years in Patagonia. We were able to go in there and experience everything that it had to offer from the wildlife, their camps, but most of all, Dorado. It was an absolutely phenomenal trip. If you ever get the chance to do something like this in this area, do it. One of the favorite things we've ever done, period. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> They're in London. Robin Hood's fighting bad guys out in the sticks, right? He's stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. It's easy to see. They're, they're definitely in cahoots together. Peter Pan could call up any time and say, hey, listen, we got a situation here. I'm fighting this dude, Captain Hook. I'm a little tiny boy that wears green tights and I can't really fight and I haven't really ever killed anyone with the sword, but apparently I'm really good with the sword, but I need the bow and arrow guy. Okay, so can you come up? So yeah, they had phones. Captain Hook comes over and he's all fired up. What's going on here? Don't you guys realize that I actually need to have no hand because otherwise, what am I, Captain Two Hands? No, I'm Captain Hook. The Gator and I are secretly friends because now I'm Captain Hook, I'm famous because he bit my, my hand off. So no need to get angry at the alligator. So, you know, I've thought about this a lot and uh, 